My journey started in a taxi cab in Buenos Aires. I had graduated from Yale Law School, concluded I was never going to be a lawyer, went down to Latin America, and I noticed that taxi driver after taxi driver in Buenos Aires had something in common. They had engineering degrees. And I thought, what are you doing driving a taxi cab? And I would ask these questions, and they would say, well, what else am I supposed to do? I don't want to work for the government. I'd say, no, 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 why don't you become an entrepreneur? You're an engineer. And they would say, a what? And so I realized that there was no word in Spanish or in Portuguese for entrepreneur. So what I did was I started going around to universities and telling stories. This was the era of Netscape and Yahoo and Apple. And I, I tell the story of Steve Jobs and Steve Woz Wozniak, and I tell it in Brazil and Argentina and Chile. And it didn't really resonate. I'd tell it in English and Spanish and Portuñol. And one day, a kid walked up to me from Argentina, and he said, you know, Linda, great story. But how does it relate to my life? I live in Latin America. No one is going to give me money to launch my crazy idea. And I don't even have a garage. <laughs> so I set out to change that. And I found uh, Peter Kellner, who was at Harvard Business School at the time. And I uh, decided to create Endeavor to support high-impact entrepreneurs from emerging markets around the world. And we said, look, there's a gap. So there was private equity. We're going to the same 10 families in these markets. And there was microfinance that was helping if you wanted to create one job at a time. But if you were an innovator with a great idea that could create hundreds, if not thousands, of jobs and millions of dollars in revenues and change an industry and change the world, who would you go to get support and mentoring and peer networking? Where could you go? So Endeavor really set out to be that support organization. 14 years later, we operate actually now in 12 countries. We support 580 entrepreneurs from 372 companies. It's actually a little bit more now. Um, they've, these have been screened from 24,000 entrepreneurs. So it's a very high bar to become an Endeavor entrepreneur. And as you see, they generate close to $4 billion in revenues now, over 150,000 jobs. And we now have a goal that it, within the next 10 years, every place where Endeavor is operating, our Endeavor entrepreneurs will be responsible for 1% GDP in these markets to prove that high impact entrepreneurship matters. So Scott asked me, as he said, to tell some of my lessons. And what I really want to focus on are the subset of entrepreneurs that we found, about 20%, who fall into the creative industries. Because we find that some lessons of entrepreneurs apply across the board, but there are unique elements of being a high impact entrepreneur in the creative field. So I really want to focus on some of these lessons and stories today. So first, this applies across the board. Are you crazy? How many of you were told you're crazy for starting your business? Well, that's good. Um, I have a motto, which is, if you're not told you're crazy, you're not thinking big enough. Crazy is a compliment. And in fact, this was backed up by the New York Times, which said there's literally a term for entrepreneurs who are crazy. It's actually a, a disease that we all share in common. It's called hypomania. And so, to which my response was, well, there's only one cure, which is venture capital. Um, but I think that what this means is that we're, we're people who ch set out to change the world, to follow your instincts. And if you're thinking big, people are going to think it's crazy because it's changing the status quo. And I noticed this myself because when we said we were starting Endeavor to support high-impact entrepreneurs in emerging markets, no one thought this was a good idea. The foundation said, you're not helping the poorest of the poor. And I have ding letter after ding letter saying they would never support an organization that was only helping to build the middle class. The VCs thought this is crazy. There are no entrepreneurs in emerging markets, and you can't trust them anyways. What are you doing? And my parents mentioned a while back, I caught them at a cocktail party lamenting to a friend that they had sent their daughter to Harvard and Yale only to have her take early retirement. So what did I do? This photo on the left was from three weeks ago. I was speaking at the Xconomy VC365 panel at MIT. And to the left, that's Bill Salmon, who's the entrepreneurship guru at Harvard Business School. Peter Brook, who is considered the international founding father of private equity. And Tim Draper, one of the well, most well-known venture, international venture capitalists. And Bill introduces me as the stalker. Now, the, what the reason is, and hence the uh, photo on the right, uh, when I was starting out, I said, OK, I need some credibility. Peter and I, everyone thinks we're crazy. We don't even have the same last, you know, the right first last name, never mind second last name in these countries. They're going to think we're a cult, which they did. We need some gravitas. 
So I heard Peter Brook speak at a Harvard Business School conference on Latin American private equity, and I knew everyone was going to you know, run after him after on stage. So I kind of waited for him in the men's bathroom, and I pounced. And he was kind of taken aback. And I explained what I was trying to do, and I told him that he should really meet with me, because after all, this was supporting entrepreneurs and venture capital in, in emerging markets. And he said, well, who's supporting you? I thought, I mean, I said, oh, well, Bill Salman, you know, at, at HBS. He said, Bill supporting you? Wow, well, yeah, maybe you should come see me. So then I went up to Bill's office, and I said, Bill, you know, I know you thought this idea we had was really crazy and was never going to amount to anything, but Peter Brooks is getting involved. And lo and behold, they joined our, they co-formed our global advisory board, P uh, did the same with... Uh, Tim Draper, who ended up joining our board. And so when Bill introduced me two weeks ago as the stalker, my response was yes, but stalking is an underrated startup strategy. <laughs> and you'll be surprised, actually, people are very uh, shy. I was actually asked by my friend Tori Birch to be a mentor at a mentoring event a few weeks ago. And a woman at my table said, God, I would love nothing more than to meet Tori Birch, but I don't want to peer forward. And I said, she's hosting an event. She invited you. Go up to her. Stalking is an underrated startup strategy. OK. So I talk about entrepreneurship a lot as a series of inflection points. But I, I really think that another way of framing it is it's a series of hurdles. It never gets easier. And I think all of you, like, like myself, have had a time where you just cross one hurdle, you want to celebrate, and then you realize you're about to trip over the next one. So I want to ask, how many of you have had to fire anybody? Yeah. How many of you have worried that you might not be able to make payroll? How many of you have had to deliver bad news to investors or partners or family? Yeah, it, it never gets easier. And so I just want you to know what I do when I'm in my dark moments is, first of all, I think back about, uh, to the Endeavor entrepreneurs who are operating in climates where, apart from the traditional obstacles for entrepreneurship, they have no tolerance of failure. There's been a lot of talk of failure. Failure is not an option. You are banned from your family in, in some places. In others, you can actually be jailed for, for bankrupting a company. So there's no failure. There's no mentorship. There's no real tolerance of, of, of risk. So when I try to think, I think, God, there are so many people around the world doing this with even more barriers. And let me remember what made me passionate. So I think about what's passionate, and then I think back to Steve Jobs and remember that he was fired a year after the Mac. So it wasn't easy for him either. All right, so next. Think big. So we see entrepreneurs, and they'll say, we want to start 10 franchises. We are at one now, but we think we can get to 10. And there'll always be someone at an Endeavor selection panel who'll say, 10, why not 100? Challenge yourself to think as big as you can get. And the great story around this is HeRef. This is a brother-sister team. They make these beautiful design artifacts. They came through an Endeavor selection panel. And a lot of people said, you know what? They're these beautiful handicrafts, but they're so in love with their products. I, I just don't see it going global. I just don't see it going to scale. And uh, so we actually rejected Ebru and, and Guvenj, told them to go back, think through their strategy. And when they were ready to think big, Endeavor would, would, would go with them. So they did. Two years later, they came back. They had two successful retail stores, multiple revenue streams, three distinct business units. So what we did is we put experts in franchising around them. We introduced them to the head of Amazon International. Today, their margins, their revenues have increased by 500%. Their margins have increased. And recently, they became the first non-EU company to sell their goods over Amazon. Um, in, the, in the UK. But more importantly, they did this with, by staying true to their roots. They still employ over 200 local artisans. They didn't fall into the trap of mass production. And they still uh, believe in their motto, which is design your culture. So going big doesn't mean abandoning your roots. Now, my favorite other uh, think big example came a couple years ago. I received this great email from Alejandro Diego and uh, his partner, Carlos Manuel Turriaga. And they said, you know, we just want to thank Endeavor for believing that two kids from Mexico City could one day grow up to win an Oscar. What they meant by this was they were starting the first post-production design company in, in Mexico. Everyone said, just go home. Maybe we have a few directors. We're never going to compete with post-production in Hollywood. But we actually set them up with a former uh, Goldman Sachs partner who had uh, invested in Avatar and X-Men. And he believed in them, and he helped them set up um, an office in, in, uh, in Hollywood, kept their production in Mexico. And they were on the team that won the best visual effects for a curious case of Benjamin Button. 
And what was interesting about that was, again, here you had these people, they were, they were believing in going big, but they kept the creative team in Mexico. And what they did, we talked to them about retention tools. A lot of you guys have, your creative workforce is so important. They're not just fungible engineers. And so they created retention programs for their, their employees. They were one of the first companies in Mexico to grant shares. And then they also had a balance, and I'm, I'm gonna get to this in a second, which is that Alejandro is the business guy and Carlos is the creative one. So it was one of these nice examples where entrepreneurs really shared strengths. Because we see a lot of types of entrepreneurs and we actually classify them. So what we find is a lot of the tech entrepreneurs are what we call diamonds in the rough. They're classic VC type entrepreneurs. They're either going to fail, if they fail, they'll fail fast. Otherwise, they have the potential of becoming a you know, major billion dollar industry. The problem is, are they too rough? Are they, how rough is that diamond? We have these growth engines, which tend to be family businesses, um, and they operate in more traditional industries. But when we find with the creatives, we call them local stars. And what happens is we fall in love with the brand, we fall in love with the charismatic individual, but a lot of times they end up being one-man shows or one-woman shows. And so a case um, we found was Francesca Romana Diana. Um, she had started this incredible uh, design and jewelry company using these precious gemstones that could only be found in Brazil. But she was making all the decisions herself. And we said to her, look, Francesca, if you really want to grow, let us help you. Let us create an advisory board that can help make some of the decisions. Let's help you think about giving what I call psychic equity to your employees. You know, you may not be the next Google, so your, your shares aren't going to be worth millions of dollars to your employees, but you can give them psychic equity. You can help them feel that they have ownership over this brand. And today, uh, Francesca has over 20 uh, retail stores around the world, from Brussels to Paris to Madrid. Okay. So another lesson, this is actually Andy Warhol. And we get a lot, you know, how do you balance the artistic vision and the bottom line? How do you not lose your soul while also going to scale? So we had a company in Colombia, Dynam Dynamo, and they wanted to do two things. They wanted to be a film production company and they wanted to have all of the creative screenwriting and distribution on the, on the creative side, but they also wanted to create the first private equity uh, film uh, fund in, in Latin America. So what we did is we helped them actually create, separate the businesses. So they actually have Dynamo Capital, which is now the first PE fund for film financing in Latin America. And then they have Dynamo Productions, which is their creative wing. And luckily, the entrepreneurs actually split nicely. Two are on more of the business side and left uh, for the fund. Two are on more of the creative side. And what it's done, and by the way, the creative side is now creating films that are financed by Dynamo, but by others as well. It's irrespective. And the Dynamo Capital doesn't have to just fund it. It can find other things to fund. So it was a nice sort of split. And the, the entrepreneurs felt it was, they were having less tension because their roles were, were structured. So today, they've grown over 300%, and Contra Corriente actually won the Sundance Film Festival in 2010. So at Endeavor, we talk a lot about mentorship. And I think that we always think about mentorship as being up or down. And I know that when entrepreneurs come into the network, they really want the best franchise expert or the best person to help them raise capital. And so we spent a lot of time creating advisory boards and thinking about people who've gone before them. But I think one of the things that's so great about conferences like the 99% is that peer mentorship we find really is as important, if not more so. Because when you have peers, they've been through it, they get it, you can share all your problems with them. And we had a case just recently of uh, Karabish. These are guys um, in Jordan. Uh, this is Arabic for scribbles. And it, um, they're designing these viral animated cartoons over the internet. And we hooked them up with Rubicon, which is a large uh, animation company in Jordan, actually now one of Jordan's most successful companies. And they're now sitting on the advisory board. And so the guys from uh, Karabish were able to help value their intellectual property. They were to help negotiate investments and figure out, again, how to divide the different uh, revenue streams. But even though we've given them some of the top mentors who are actually investors, they found that Rubicon, that talking to people who are peers, who've been through things more recently, are actually adding value in a, in a much more hands-on way. So I hope that all of you, in addition to looking for mentors, will go out and find some peers where you can share your experiences, because we found that that's tremendously valuable. 
They just, um, by the way, signed a deal with uh, YouTube for a pre as a premium channel partner. Okay. So I, I love that uh, this conference is about making it ha things happen because we also believe that the startups are not the hardest phase. It's, it's taking things to scale. It's reaching that inflection point. It's going over those hurdles. That's what it takes to, to get to the next level. And so in Brazil, we started a campaign uh, called Bota Pra Facer, which means make it happen, although things always sound sexier in Portuguese. Bota Pra Facer. This is Michael Dell, um, who shared his story in one of the clips, and two of our entrepreneurs from a company called Spoleto, the first fast food pasta chain uh, in the country. We met them. They were two guys. It's $3 million. They, they talked even faster than I do. And today, it's a $200 million franchise. They have 3,500 employees. They've branched out. And they talked about how if they can do it, so can you. And that reached, six, that campaign reached 60 million people in Brazil. And within the next week, we had 7 million business plans. We don't take business plans, but we got 7 million people who said they had been inspired to become an entrepreneur because of hearing stories like this. But in the end, as you all know, it's about not just the idea, it is about making things happen. And the last thing I'll, I'll remind you of, it's never supposed to be easy. It's not easy being a pioneer. It's not easy creating something new. But it's not supposed to be. Because as a mentor once said to me, if it were easy, it would have been done before. Thank you.